Arlene, I just wanted to confirm. So do you know how long roughly your presentation will be today? Mm, I'm thinking more than no more than seven minutes. How many okay. presenters are there? Um, for this afternoon, just yourself. So we wanted to make sure we had dedicated time for you. And so what we'll do is we'll run through your presentation um, about, you know, seven to ten minutes, how, whatever, and then we'll turn it over to committee members to ask questions. And so um, I feel like we should be wrapped up here by about uh, 1.45, and then that gives an opportunity. There's uh, another committee that comes in at 2. And so we just wanted okay. to make sure that we were working within um, your expectations for time limit as well. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I will now call this meeting for the Standing Committee on Social Development to order. My name is Caitlin Cleveland, and I am the MLA for Cam Lake uh, and the chair of this committee. The NWT Legislative Assembly Standing Committee on Social Development is made up of regular members who can look deeper into social issues affecting NWT residents. The committee has identified its priority as increasing and improving housing stock as well as access to housing according to the needs of small communities, regional centres and Yellowknife. The committee is currently meeting with community stakeholders to focus on the challenges and barriers faced by NWT residents in regards to home ownership and private market rent. Committee will provide recommendations to the Government of the Northwest Territories to make changes or improvements to programs and services that support both homeownership and private market rentals in the Northwest Territories. Today we are meeting with Ms. Arlene Hache, who is with the Women's National Housing and Homelessness Network and is also a longtime community advocate here in Yellowknife. And so just to start things off, Arlene, what I'd like to do first is just go around the room and allow members to introduce themselves. We have members both here in the room who are abiding by social distancing rules and we also have some members that have joined us on the phone lines as well today. And so I'll start off first with the member to my left. Thanks, Madam Chair. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Katrina Knockleby, MLA for Great Slave. Rylan Johnson, MLA for Yellowknife North. Thank you very much, members. And I'd like to turn it over to members on the phone line, starting with MLA Semler. Lisa Semler, MLA for Inuvik Twin Lakes. And MLA Bonnet Rouge. Ron Bonnetus, MLA Decho. Rocky Simpson, MLA Hay River South. Excellent. Thank you very much, members. I'll now turn it over to yourself, our uh, Ms. Hache, and uh, please proceed with your presentation. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the invitation, and I really appreciate being able to speak to the Standing Committee on Social Development, especially when it comes to uh, housing in the Northwest Territories. And um, aside from kind of um, the many ways people might know me, <laughs> I thought I would add some other factors you know, and why it would be important for me to be able to talk to <clears throat> the MLAs about housing in the Northwest Territories. <clears throat> so since this particular topic is focused on home ownership and, you know, um, being a landlord, et cetera, I thought I would let you know that I am a home homeowner. I own my home. I, I've been a homeowner for about 30 years. I lived in an apartment for 13 years prior to buying a home, so I certainly know how that uh, sort of, uh, I know of that experience. And um, when I came to the Northwest Territory, I also lived in a shelter for women who were homeless. And then I established a shelter, and I ran that for almost 30 years. <clears throat> I sat on the National Advisory Committee on Homelessness that was chaired by Adam Vaughn which really looked at the allocation of resources when it comes to housing in Canada and addre addressing the issue of homelessness. <clears throat> in my uh, uh, effort on that committee and uh, my colleague from the Yukon, we really focused on three things. One was making sure that the federal government recognized that there was a real need for nor a northern specific stream of funds to address housing and homelessness in the north because of its unique um, challenges, because of jurisdictional issues, particularly when it comes to uh, sort of the loss of uh, 
loss of um, assets or loss of income into the Northwest Territories that uh, for Indigenous people that are not living on reserves. So we sort of never have that avenue to access resources for Indigenous people in the Northwest Territories. Uh, the other thing we fought for was a women-specific stream of funding because women, especially uh, single mother households, are often left marginalized. Women fleeing violence are left marginalized in the housing market and without housing and unhoused and in shelters. So my friend from the Yukon and I really fought for that as well. And the final thing we really fought for was making sure that there was an, indi an Indigenous specific stream of funding so that Indigenous people design and control their own housing. And so we were successful to some extent in, in getting all three of those things uh, understood and acknowledged in the housing strategy, not to the degree that we wanted, but to some degree. Uh, so I really wanted to, uh, when I'm thinking about housing, like I'm a sort of gut sort of person. So my analysis is not like stats and stuff. So I go to the gut. And, you know, when I'm thinking about housing in the Northwest Territories, as I witnessed it over 50 years, I think about um, uh, Elder Muriel Betsina, who is no longer with us, and her fight to own her own house and build her own house and design her own house the way it fit for her family and just the grief she got from the housing uh, corporation and the fight she had to say you know I have a large family and this is the house I deserve and this is the house I want to build etc and she just got such grief from the housing corporation she never did get the support that she should have gotten to build her own house and um, so I think about Muriel you know when I'm thinking about what are our solutions now the other person I think about is um, uh, Francis Wilkie, who started the uh, uh, housing issues in the Northwest Territories in Nunavut, and it, only ha it has over a, a thousand members now. Uh, talking about the housing challenges across the Northwest Territories and Nunavut and for community people who don't have the advantages that you would in the city or in uh, small centres. So these are the people that are on my mind when I'm looking at housing in the Northwest Territories. And finally, I do think about you know the people that I call sort of solids when it comes to understanding housing and homelessness and those people for me is Adam Vaughn you know who really battled uh, you know his colleagues to say these three uh, these three asks around indigenous designed housing for indigenous people women specific housing and northern specific streams of funding you know he really backed those up with the help of Michael McLeod and Adam Vaughn would tell you without Michael it would have been really hard so you know at the end of the day it was Michael McLeod cloud Adam of housing that succeeded in really bringing resources into the north on housing that would have made a difference unfortunately the housing corporation did not have the capacity or the knowledge or almost anything else to get it out the door so that sort of still burns a little bit and then I just have to say although they kind of figured it out two years later they, there is no evidence, actually, in my mind, that the Housing Corporation really can figure anything out, you know, in terms of how it impacts communities. And then when I really look at it, I go back to my favorite, more recent quote from Mr. Tucho, Kyle Tucho, from Colville Lake, who said, you know, uh, he built his own house because he got tired of waiting, <laughs> waiting for the Housing Corporation and he cut the cut his logs he hasn't built a house yet but it's coming and he's saying once i've built the house i own it and i can't be kicked out and do you know how many women i know that want that so solid uh opportunity to own the house they're in not that they want to own it but they don't want to be kicked out they don't want to be kicked out of housing forever anyway so i just wanted to Take the opportunity, even though it might be slightly outside of what we're talking about today, that you cannot forget that there is a massive difference between Yellowknife 
to some degree the regional centers and small communities and part of that massive difference is you know the impact lack of housing and lack of vision around housing has for indigenous people and then i just kind of have to smile and say i find you know across canada there's no no jurisdiction like the northwest territories who kind of wants to take a blind approach to um any question you know that they're looking at in terms of solving they sort of want to ignore the fact that the real disparity is between indigenous and non-indigenous uh residents of the northwest territories and i'm just looking at this stat now i'm just trying to find it the incident of core incidents of core housing need for indigenous uh, residents is 22.3% compared to 8.3% for non-indigenous people. And those people are generally living in the city. You know, so when the question was asked, there was questions about, you know, what do homeowners need to be, you know, have more support? What do landlords need to have more support? I have to say to myself, who are these people that own houses? I'm one of them. I'm a sitting in Yellowknife and, uh, and you know i'm so i sort of want to don't want to get stuck in that so much but just to say i think it would be um not balanced and not wise to have a conversation about homeowners and landlords without the rest of the conversation which is people who can't own homes but want them who are waiting for the housing corporation to do something that never gets done and finally we have young people who are stepping up and saying okay i'm tired of waiting so i think i'll do it myself and the other thing that struck me was uh, these young guys had taken a log building course in bc years before and it didn't translate into building a home so i thought that was pretty pretty interesting and exciting because you know you had an elder i think it was in a clavic that built his own home as well so finally the pennies dropped that don't wait for the housing corporation because there are local materials and there is uh knowledge and community people can build their own housing they don't have to wait for anybody and the reason i want to focus on that just a little bit is because of two things one is I'm working with uh, Indigenous women in Northern Ontario, and we are really focused on doing uh, uh, housing carpentry, maintenance, etc., to teach women to build and own their own housing in Northern Ontario. And that's what I want for the Northwest Territories, because my experience is women living in a subsidized housing or social housing or families are ejected and treated so badly worse is families living in transition housing that have zero protections from rent uh, uh, through rental legislation so i find uh, women in particular are at extreme disadvantage when uh, at being unhoused and uh, so Uh, For example, I'm working with a woman now, we just did a virtual job fair, and I'm working with a woman who built her house out of straw bales and clay. And she has a large house, her grandchildren go and play there. This is not like a little haphazard shack. This is a fully operational house that she built out of straw bales and clay. I'm not suggesting that for the Northwest Territories. I'm suggesting that somehow Northern residents have been persuaded they have to wait for a housing corporation that has proven it can't do much. And I want sort of to encourage Northern residents to move forward, build their own housing, create their own solutions, look at their own uh, local material for building and not wait any longer for something that is not there and probably will never come. So I really sort of want to take an opportunity to say that I am hoping that the Northwest Territories will really look at um, or sort of partnering up with the Indigenous Housing Caucus of the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association. And they have developed a solid, um, a solid ask in terms of how they see moving forward. And the reason I raise this is because in my mind we're talking about indigenous people not having the capacity so much or especially outside of the yellow knife not having the capacity to be a homeowner so i am uh, hoping that you will look at the principles 
that that organization is looking at in terms of having housing designed by Indigenous people for Indigenous people. And from my perspective, again, even though the GNWT uh, sort of gives lip service to that idea or partnering or being equal partners, they really have no uh, evidence that they actually know how to do that. But you have a really solid uh, group of people that you can partner with that would really change how housing is uh, provided in the Northwest Territories. So I'll just go on a few little um, uh, uh, items around, um, like part of me doesn't want to get into much about the challenges of home ownership because you know them better than anybody else. You know, it's the high cost of land development, transportation and building operation, et cetera, et cetera. But I think if we look to the communities again, that we could solve that. I just think the GNWT doesn't think outside the box. So for example, I've got um, you know small uh, native owned housing in communities who are willing now to partner around training young people and women to do maintenance in their own house. And I remember approaching the NWT Housing Corporation to say, partner up, let's, let's teach people in the communities at the very minimum how to take care of their house and their home. And they couldn't sort of think outside the box to do that. And, um, and so they couldn't extend themselves even beyond uh, sort of subsidized housing to say not teach you know their grandchildren and children how to help the elder take care of their home so they sort of are still so siloed they can't really see a uh, a community vision for how you deal with housing and then i sort of i know that there was a thought to do housing plans i know there was one housing plan done and i don't know if there's any other housing plans done so i'm kind of interested in you know these housing plans in the communities, how did that pan out? You know, the last time we did like um, plans, community plans, by the time the community plan was done, there was no funding to actually implement them. So I'm really interested in knowing in terms of this question, home ownership and, uh, you know, landlords, how is that being uh, incorporated into those community plans and will there be an effort to implement those plans? And then, um, you know, I when I think of uh, home ownership, I firmly believe after being here for 30 years and kind of watching it closely, that there was never a real vision that community people should own their own home. It was always assumed that if you didn't have a job and if you were, um, you know, an RCMP, a teacher, a nurse, you got a house. Everybody else was in subsidized housing, and there was no thought to create a private market in small communities. And so I would like some effort put on uh, really helping community people uh, develop their own skills and their own housing solutions. And young people showed us how to do it. So I'm interested in that. In terms of landlords, man, like... Um, the biggest landlord in the Northwest Territories is subsidized housing. And they're a bit of a nightmare. And so I know I'm not supposed to talk about that today, but I don't know how you leave the largest landlord out of the discussion. Because once you're out, out the door from that landlord, you have no other landlord unless you duck around into private market housing. And, uh, and then I think of Yellowknife, you know, the largest landlord that essentially has a monopoly, deliberately uh, uh, instituted an anti-rights uh, uh, policy that says that they wouldn't accept anyone on income support simply because they want income support, even though it's against the NWG human rights legislation on the basis of uh, social condition. No one in the government or anywhere else has challenged that landlord for doing that. And the GNWT continued to pay corporate uh, rent to that landlord in spite of the fact that it was uh, discriminatory against its residents. And then finally, I just have to say, you know, when the YWCA shelter burnt down, it was very interesting for me. The YWCA transition house burnt to the ground. Overnight, there were over 30 families that needed immediate housing. Where did those people find housing? They found housing in empty apartments held by landlords that would not rent to those people.
there was housing available, there was rental uh, units available that they were excluded from accessing by the landlord through a discriminatory policy. And then I had to watch the community. They were housed, rental subsidies worked, and it was excellent because somebody else managed the rental subsidy. However, it was amazing to watch the community of Yellowknife say, the poor YWCA, they lost their transition house. We need to build them a new one. And I just thought, did you see what happened? These people were left in transition housing erroneously because the landlord practiced discriminatory legislation. They could have had their own home already, their own rental home, without being in transition housing that had no protection, has no protection for those individuals. Anyway, so... Um, I've watched the rental legislation. I go to hearings with uh, 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 people who are being evicted, and landlords have huge advantages in terms of being able to appear before the rental office with uh, lawyers, etc., to evict all kinds of people. So I'm not sure what they would say, but I would counter almost anything they said, that's for sure. So uh, the other thing that I just wanted to kind of uh, add is a few solutions that I think would be helpful, other than the ones that I already mentioned. I think the HAP program was an excellent program. I just think it was a little off, but community people still are looking back to that HAP program saying that was a, a, a workable, worthwhile housing, or work, worthwhile model. I think the other thing, uh, the Housing Corporation has had some great ideas. I just don't know if they've done them yet. You know, for example, having a local hardware, functioning as a local hardware store in the community is a great idea. They do have maintenance people. And why aren't those maintenance people training people in the community to uh, show people how to maintain their own housing? And then I think there has to be new forms of financing uh, to look at housing cooperatives. And I have to um, kind of smile to myself in a sad sort of way saying, you know, I did bring the idea of more cooperative models because I want women to own their own housing so they don't, kick out, they don't get kicked out by their partner or anyone else. And I went to the housing corporation and they basically said cooperatives are a failed, a failed model in the Northwest Territories because community people don't know how to manage cooperatives. And it's actually not true. In Yellowknife, there's a successful co-op model and there's one that didn't work out so well. And I don't think communities should be penalized from accessing that model simply because one in Yellowknife failed. Am I, am I going over time? No, you're good. Please keep going. Thank you, Arlene. Okay. Uh, so I think, hang on a second, I'll just make sure I'm finished. Um, I think that uh, designing uh, housing that is culturally appropriate is really important, which is why I want the GNWT to hook up with the uh, Indigenous Caucus of the CHRA. I think uh, it, it is a responsibility for the Housing Corporation to help community people, help people applying for housing to actually do the funding proposals. Uh, to the federal government because I actually want federal resources to be brought into the Northwest Territories. We fought for it really hard and, you know, again, sort of having uh, the funding come into the Northwest Territories and just sit there uh, and, you know, and having the housing corporations say that it's not being accessed because community people don't know how to do it. I just thought that was disgusting because you know get off your ass and help them write a proposal then i've written thousands of them it's not that hard to do in my view and uh so i think that's a real job that they should have and then uh let me just see so i think rental supplements are really important uh let me see I think that's about it. I think that's about it. So I wish I could. I wish I could sort of talk about subsidized housing because it's kind of burning at me. There's a couple of really critical issues, eh? Like, like uh, this week I'm dealing with a, a father and his children because the father's name wasn't on the lease, even though he lived in the home for over a decade.
on the lease passed away. So he's in Yellowknife, homeless with his children because his partner passed away from cancer from subsidized housing. That's totally unacceptable. So I'll be phoning the MLA for that, that person. However, the minister knows about that and so no response so far. Anyway, so that's not, I think it's for today because I don't really think that uh, the, the Social Development Committee should silo discussions without looking at the whole discussion but i'm trusting you don't do that like i'm trusting you go back to the other questions around housing and do a sort of integrated look at it at some point that's what i'm hoping and trusting thank you thank you very much miss hache we really appreciate your time today your your experience is incredibly valuable and we really appreciate that and we are going to um we needed to be able to approach the the giant kind of huge conglomerate of housing in the Northwest Territories and and siloing them was the way that we decided to kind of go about starting the conversation with stakeholders. And so talking about supportive housing and transitional housing is definitely something that we're going to get to with um, the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation. They're really focused on home ownership right now. And so we wanted to make sure that we prioritize that as, as a committee and gave stakeholders the opportunity to weigh in right off the bat. Um, what I'll do right away uh, is pass it right off to committee members who have questions or comments. Um, committee, who would like to start us off today? Emily Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Ms. Hache, for presenting, and uh, thanks for all your, your continued advocacy and, and work in, in this area. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're doing the work of an MLA. I, I, you, I know you've referred a number of constituents to me, and. Uh, uh, you've you've helped many of my constituents find housing, so I, I appreciate that. Um, I one of the areas which I I, I mean I I find myself you know uh, agreeing with m pretty much everything you have said today, but I one of the areas I I do think that uh, I would like to focus on a bit is uh, where you said that there's never really been a vision for uh, home ownership or or a private market in small communities, and. I, I'm not convinced that this is the impossibility that the Housing Corp has made it out to be, that we can't, you know, find some way of uh, allowing there to be a market in communities. I, I, and I think, as you said, there's, you know, there's other ways. Co-op co housing does that. Or, you know, we may have to support the HAP program and, and recognize that it, it'll, it'll need continued funding for operations and maintenance of those houses, but people actually can own the houses. Um, so I guess I just, perhaps I could have you speak a little bit more to how you think some of the steps we could take to, to make sure that, you know, people in a community, if they want to own a home, have that option. And I, because right now that it's just simply not an option in many communities. And I, I don't see the Housing Corp doing anything about that or, or even viewing it as their mandate to, to do anything about that. Um, yeah, so any insight you could provide on that area. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, well, Emily Johnson. Ms. Hache? So I just want to kind of clarify, maybe. I actually think community people can envision home ownership well. I think the Housing Corporation cannot uh, envision home ownership at all when it comes to community people, and let me be clear, Indigenous people. And so... Um, I, and I think community people, because of colonization and because of the long-standing uh, role the NWT Housing Corporation has had in, quote, addressing housing issues that they haven't addressed, I think community people have been robbed of the knowledge and the uh, opportunity to understand that they did uh, resolve their housing issues at some some point in the past. They can again, and some people have discovered, don't wait for the housing corporation because it will not happen, it will never happen. And so I think that resurgence of vision is happening, which is really exciting. It's just sad for me that uh, the housing corporation, it's not just the housing corporation, but that's who we're talking about today, just has immobilized and robbed community people of a vision because they can't carry one. They can't even carry, you know, $60 million out the door. 
So they're the wrong people. Like, they're the wrong people to spearhead a vision of any sort. Now, they did the community plans. I don't know where they're at. I don't know if the community plan included some kind of visioning exercise about how do we own our own homes in our communities? Or was that uh, government-facilitated discussions that really focused on subsidized housing still owned by the GNWT? Like, I got a call from a small community who wanted to apply on federal money to provide housing to their members. I'm confident they would have got it. But for the GNWT to partner, the community would have had to sign over ownership of this resource to the GNWT or agree somehow that the GNWT would end up with that resource. And I just say, why? Why on earth would that ha- Why would that happen? I would never do it myself. So I, I'm, I don't know the inner workings, I have to say that. However, I've been around for 50 years. And the Housing Corporation is sort of singularly immobile and visionless and i just go back to when COVID started you know when COVID started the Yellowknife women's society had a deal on the in the works to set up a transitional house at a hotel it stalled because the federal government was blaming the housing corporation the housing corporation was blaming the federal government when COVID hit the deal was done in two weeks so i just thought to myself how does that happen in two weeks that it was totally off the table and I go back to the housing corporation. <laughs> to me, it's not the federal government because I work with the federal government well. I, 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 you just have a totally immobile administrative body. And, you know, the, the NWT Housing Corporation has no board. They have one guy who runs it, theoretically. But really, what does he run? He doesn't run $60 billion out the door. And even though they have a plan now... Uh, we'll see. I'm not convinced they can get it out the door in an effective way that leaves communities feeling like they own stuff, like they have developed that solution, they own it, it's in the community, least likely that community people feel they own it. Well, I had to laugh because I talked to the minister one time and she said, we're not going to uh, do renovations in a small community anymore because there's too much vandalism. We're not going to paint the houses, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, like if you taught women in the community and youth to paint, repair, manage their own houses, they're not going to vandalize those houses because somebody's going to kick them in the ass. They're not going to want their work going down the toilet. So it's the lack of feeling that people own stuff. It has to be the verbalizing or saying or paying lip service to, we all got to work together when actually they haven't demonstrated they can work with really anybody. And the housing corporation is top of the list on that one, in my view. But thank you, um, uh, Rylan. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hashi. I'll make the next answer shorter. <laughs> uh, Emily Bonnet Rouge. <clears throat> Merci, Madam Chair. Merci, uh, Ms. Hashi, for your presentation. Um, I feel like uh, I could get to know you better because of uh, some of the stuff you've said. Um, that looks like uh, you're a real advocate for people and uh, small communities. Um, I note that you spoke about uh, the HAP program. I was a recipient of the HAP program back in the day. Um, and also your mention of log buildings. Uh, I do log buildings also, and uh, it's been an interest of mine since those times. Uh, through the HAP program, I built uh, my own log home here. Um, and that was, that was free housing given to First Nations people at that time. Uh, I'm kind of really disappointed that that program or similar did, uh, did not continue. I think the precursor to the HAP program was the SHAG program, the Small Settlement Home Assistance Grant. Uh, then they changed it to HAP and uh, it went uh, a whole different direction after that. They wanted First Nations to start paying for their stuff, getting into a mortgage. Like uh, Somebody decided that, well, we need to educate these people. And uh, that wasn't, you know, that shouldn't have been their call. That's not what we see. My people, as Bennett people, we always 
are adamant the federal government now through the territorial government to provide free housing to us uh, as Dene people. Um, so I was intrigued by, by your comments there. Um, and I also tried to strike, uh, get the committee to to have that as part of their review on the housing programs, uh, how it started and everything like this and where it moved, what direction it went to. You know, it went way off the the rails there because it was mainly geared for First Nations then Dene people. Now it, it's moving away from it. Um, their concentration is now, it's oh, it's open for everybody now. So it's, uh, it kind of went by the wayside in that, in that regard anyways. Um, I'm just wondering if, uh, if you are a one-man show in your, whether you have committee, uh, do you have any members, and uh, do you reach out to the communities? That would be my first question. Masi. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily Bonnerouge. Ms. Hache? Well, how kind of you, uh, Mr. Bonnerouge. You know, at the end of the day, it was never free housing. The genocide of Indigenous people in Canada and in the Northwest Territories paid heavily for that housing. And, and you know, I remember... Uh, people my age, now I'm almost 70, saying the housing corporation took my grandmother's house and that was my house. So let me just say, I could be wrong and I challenge the other minister about it. I worked for the Denny Nation in the, in the 80s, 70s and 80s. I understood housing was a treaty right, housing was to cost nothing, and the policy changed. All of a sudden, the GNWT changed the policy where people paid housing. And so when people paid housing, all of a sudden, they, they didn't. And I could see, because I was around, older people would really struggle with why they were supposed to pay for housing because it was free. It wasn't the money. So at the end of the day, housing authorities, as we progressed, you know, over decades, the government and the housing authorities kept portraying community people like they were lazy, like they just didn't get it, like they were just like totally incapable of managing their money, like all the negative ways they described Indigenous people who didn't pay rent. But I was around. People who didn't pay rent were told, and I'm talking about grandmothers now and grandfathers they were told that that housing was to be free and all of a sudden the government changed the rules so I really understand that and now I have to laugh about uh, the committee you know you ever hear that saying it's a biblical saying about the uh, prophet is there is no honor for a prophet in his own home so I'm recognized across Canada I'm actually recognized around it globally uh, for things other than the more recent sort of thing. Uh, so people recognize my lived experience, I think, from living in a shelter and listening closely, you know, to elders and people in the community and understanding, you know, the rights and the expectations of community people. I have no committee. I'm a diehard advocate. I'm 70. I'll stay an advocate until I'm no longer here. But that's why I do suggest people that do have committees and the uh, uh, Canadian, uh, what do you call that, CHRA, which is the Canadian Rural Housing Association, has an Indigenous committee led by Robert Byer, and they're very knowledgeable about Indigenous housing design, very knowledgeable about uh, how Indigenous people want to sort of develop, develop their home ownership. So there is a committee that exists nationally for Indigenous people, and they're connected in the Northwest Territories because the Housing Corporation person sits on that committee, on that national committee and that National Indigenous Caucus. So I can find out who it is and let you know who it is. So like me, I'm just a street person who learned along the way. So I, I have nothing special except age and experience. But I know people that do, that could lead that vision for community people back to what they already know. Masi Cho, Masi. Thank you, Arlene. Or sorry, thank you, Ms. Hache. Emily Bonnet Rouge. Um, Masi, Madam Chair, and Masi, uh, for, for your comments, uh, Ms. Hache. Um, I, I recognize that um, 
We've had presentations from other groups in Yellowknife. Uh, there's still the YWCA. We've had to hear from them yet, but there was also the Wo Yellowknife Women's Society. There seems to be a whole bunch of, uh, you know, NGO groups in Yellowknife that are all addressing the same, the same issue regarding homelessness and, and advocating for women's groups. Um, I'm not going to say anything about, well, who's advocating for the men, but, you know, it's, it's families, mm -hmm. I guess, in the communities. I'm wondering if you ever meet with these Yellowknife groups, mm -hmm. um, you know, that are addressing the same thing, and everybody maybe get together and speak the same language there, because uh, uh, I see all different groups that are all chasing the same pot of money uh, uh, for the same issue and probably for the same number of people. Uh, I just wonder if your comments on that one, and uh, I think, and uh, I'd like to say, Masi, for you, to you for appearing before us, Masi. Thank you, Emily Bonnet Rouge Masashi. To run the uh, Yellowknife Women's Society or the Center for years, eh? And. Um, Actually, we were always marginalized as kind of the wild bunch, you know, because at the end of the day, well, at the end of the day, the um, sort of, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but I'd love to have a conversation about it because I've always advocated for a family-oriented approach, but it's because of the damage of the genocide and colonization that things are not balanced. And so it's just balancing stuff. Like I remember I worked on a project with uh, Indigenous men, you know, who don't use violence. And we did a video about, you know, you know what kinds of things help them not do that. And we really worked with men, Indigenous men in the Northwest Territories, and we interviewed a lot of men. And it was a great project that the GNWT filed and didn't do anything with however i remember going into the community later and some of the men would came and they came because i was talking about women and they would say well like what about men and you know how come we're not invited and stuff like that and i said this time we got you first this time we listened to you first and <laughs> now we're listening to women so what i want to say to you though is it's been misrepresented and misunderstood, I think, by some groups in Yellowknife. There is no community women I have ever met that wanted to leave men behind. They, it's brothers, uncles, sons. They love community. They love their family. They want a family solution. So I've always been family focused. My effort in... Uh, in working with women was women and their families to make sure that given colonization and the impact and the imbalance that we protect women from the levels of violence that they experience in communities. How women's groups in Yellowknife do that, we have fought about that for years. So I get into battles with women's groups in Yellowknife. But I think they should listen more to community people. I just don't think they hear community people. Thank you very much, Arlene. Uh, Emily Nockleby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll just keep this brief. Uh, I've had a lot of opportunity to speak with Arlene over the years as well about uh, her work. So uh, she's always really good at informing us, and I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to come back to the comments about the YWCA and the transitional housing after their fire. I did want to clarify that the Y was actually subsidizing a lot of those market leases themselves, and it was putting them in a position of uh, financial uncertainty. I don't know if that's changed because my involvement with the Y has long passed, but at that point in time, that really was what the concern was. They couldn't afford to continue to pay market rent. Um, that sort of leads into the question I do have for you, um, Ms. Hache, is that um, you had mentioned that there is zero protection for transitional housing tenants uh, in the north because of the nature of how it's set up. And I know that's a little bit off, and I'm actually thinking because we're out of time, I might follow up with you on this outside of, of this meeting. But I'm curious to know what, you're, what you see as solutions for that and, and a little bit more on that topic. But I'm looking at the chair, and I'm thinking maybe I should just follow up with you after. Is that... <laughs> Thank you very much, Emily Nockleby. And we are on, we've got a bit of about five minutes left here, uh, but I'll pass it right quick back over to Ms. Hashe. Thank you. 
I just have a quick answer, actually. One is um, I realize in, th in theory that the Y covered some of that funding. I would have backed the Y and fought for the Y to get more funding for that approach. So they didn't give anyone that opportunity. So I'm looking forward to having a discussion with the Y about that. And just about protections, I think two things, taking a rights-based approach to housing, which the federal government has legislated now, is critical for the Northwest Territories as well, looking at housing as a right. The next thing is transition housing tenants are paying rent. They should be treated as renters and protected by the Rens Residential Tenancy Act, just like any other tenant. And that would solve the problem. I would be friends with the women's groups again. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Hache. Emily Knockleby, do you have a follow-up? Just quickly, yeah, I do appreciate that. So basically what you're saying is it's just a matter of a small change to the act in, in bringing in transitional renters uh, under that protection. Is that correct? Thank you. Totally. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Hache. I'll pass it over to MLA Simpson to finish us off here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess uh, I just want to make a quick comment here and uh, uh, with something that... Uh, was said and with respect to how the housing corporations managed and i do agree with uh, Ms. Hache on that uh, that you know uh, i think it lacks forward thinking the corporation uh, it's it's i think it's kind of living in the past and uh, hasn't looked for any new solutions and and somebody does have to kick them so but saying that when we talk about housing i guess Myself, I you know I was born and raised in, in Hay River, and uh, you know I'm Indigenous and, and lived here my whole life, and you know uh, and I've always been out there trying to, to help people as well in my own way. But when we talk about housing in, in small communities as well, is that we you know we can't just talk about housing on its own. We have to talk about jobs, education, health, and justice as well. So you know it's fine to say that we want everybody in the communities to own a house, but I guess, how do you reconcile, how do you see us reconciling, you know, giving, uh, not giving, but providing people with their own units that, that, that uh, you know, that we know what it costs to maintain. Uh, do, you, do we expect uh, the government to continue, continue uh, providing the, uh, the maintenance and, and those types of costs as well? Because, you know, unless, unless there's jobs out there, it, it's pretty difficult and, uh, uh, you know, to uh, to maintain a home. Thank you. Thank you, Emily Simpson. Ms. Hache? Uh, <clears throat> you hit the nail right on the head. You, you're exactly right. Like, it's tying in skills, jobs, and economic development in with all of that, as well as the support uh, thing. Let me just say this. I've been for the past 10 years involved in a pre-employment training program for non-traditional jobs for Indigenous women based on culture, giving confidence to women to be able to do jobs. We train 478 Indigenous women to do non-traditional jobs, of those women, 301 got jobs in non-traditional trades. We have no effort like that in the Northwest Territories. So there's jobs. There, there may not be wage jobs, but there's always work in a community. There's always jobs in a community. So I don't know if I made it very clear, but I see women building their own housing, maintaining their own housing, and youth, and families. It's all about... Uh, being there from the the old hat model. There was nothing wrong with the old, old hat model. The only problem was the housing corporation wanted to tell community people how it was going to be built, how big, and they stuck their nose in it and not allowed families to design their own their own housing. But that hat model was a good one, and so was co-op housing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hache. Uh, Emily Simpson, do you have a really quick follow-up? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, you. Uh, I guess one of the, one of the the big uh, issues I see is is the non market versus the market communities. Like you know, for myself, uh, what I like to see in the market communities is that we engage uh, the private sector more to provide housing. And at this point, you know, I don't really care whether they're from the south or from the north, as long as uh, as long as we see our wait lists uh, decrease. But in the non market communities, it's a real issue. So again, how do you reconcile, I guess, the difference between the market and the non-market uh, community with respect to housing? Thank you. 
Thank you, Emily Simpson. Well, Nastasha? I don't have a quick answer to that other than an elder built his own house. We've got a, three young people in Culver Lake that are going to build their own house. To me, that's private market housing. I'm not sure we... Now, again, I'm not an expert in it. I'm just saying that's private market housing. That's home ownership. They're doing it themselves. That's what I, that's what I want to see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hashe. And I really want to take this opportunity to thank you for your time today. Um, we really value your input and we look forward to being able to hear from you again when we do look at supportive housing and transitional housing and, and also the uh, the public housing as well. And so I just want to say thank you very much for your time today and we really appreciate you speaking with committee. Thank you. Thank you. Merci, Cho. Thank you. We'll see. The, the next uh, public committee that we'll, we'll be presenting um, right after us here today is the Special Committee on Reconciliation and Indigenous Affairs. And so um, it, all, it all works together. So thank you so much. It'll be a good one. Thank you.